how um how over your career have you uh, learned to build teams and integrate you know talent? I mean, it's one thing to go out and and buy a stock in a business. It's another thing to bring in a wholly owned subsidiary and truly learn abdication or not abdication, but you know, like uh, I t- I talked to the to the person that runs Virginia Sprinkler, and he said he was like working or after I sold to Markel. It was as they said it would be. And I don't get meddled with, uh, you know, occasionally I'm told, you know, to send some money back to corporate or not, but that like all the decisions are still mine. Uh, You know, it's one thing to model Buffett. It's another thing to live that type of, uh, you know, management philosophy. Uh, How how has it happened for you? Well, to some degree, it's the the old Montessori method, Montessori schools. You learn by doing. And within the context of Markel Ventures, again, I talked about in 2005, we had had the mindset or thought by being observers of the Berkshire model that this was a, a good path and a good way to do things. But it, but it wasn't until 2005. I mean, I'd been here since 1990. That's a long gestation period before the stars aligned where a specific circumstance, some specific people, some specific businesses uh, came about such that we, we could go ahead and do that. And by doing that, um, again, it was a piece that had it not worked well, we'll, we'll live to fight another day. Uh, we, we could absorb making an epic mistake. And, and we've made some mistakes along the way, but that's, that's, that's how you learn. The old joke, you know, good judgment comes from experience, which comes from bad judgment. So the truthful answer to your question and the learn by doing is you just start doing it. And you start doing it with the mindset that, look, we we want to have people who are interested in staying with these businesses, management teams that have been successful. We want them to stay and we want them to keep going. And and, uh, an interesting statement I heard recently, and this is related to Constellation Software up in Toronto, if you're familiar with them. Mm -hmm. It's been an epically successful uh, company. My wife, Susan Gaynor, actually happens to be on, on the board up there. Uh, they would use the phrase that accountability is more important than scale. So they mm-hmm. have many, 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 many business units. When you have people at the business unit who are really the CEO of that business, they have accountability that exists for their result. Just like the VSC uh, gentleman that is the CEO of that business, he he runs that. Now he's forgotten more about the fire sprinkler business than I will ever know. And he also knows that he's accountable for the results. And he also knows that we're long-term people and we understand why you might wish to incur an expense today that has payoffs years, years down the, down the road, you know, the the net present value of that kind of decision can be extremely positive and we're willing uh, to think very, very long-term. So it's created something of a flywheel where these kinds of people are just attracted to Markel because they talk to their friends. So the, when, when I'm talking to somebody, it, in many cases, they have been referred to me by people, people who are already running Mark Alvinger's businesses. And they will, they will be like what you described. Uh, and they'll say, look, th- those guys actually did what they said they would do. And they, uh, they, they allow for an autonomous operation. I'm, I'm having fun. It's going well. And, and it's working. And, and one final example of, of that would be that the the gentleman who was the CEO of AMF when we bought it in 2005, it is now 18 years later. He still runs that business. And that means that means that we did what we said we would do, and he did what he said he would do. That's that's win-win in play. Were, were that not true, he would not still be there. So yeah. the system is designed to mutually reinforce itself over and over and over and over again. And there's, there's really just no way to to uh, jumpstart that or snap it into being and, and create instant pudding. You, you got you to gotta cook the pudding for a while and get it hot and then let it cool before you can start eating it. And we, we've done that for long enough that we have credibility in, in the marketplace such that we, we get exposed to situations and circumstances that uh, people want what we have, and there, there's not a ton of organizations who are set up in the way that we are with permanent capital as opposed to venture by venture capital, and such that, that that makes us a very attractive home for a lot of people.
once upon a time uh, at one of the Omaha lunches, you said that you used to search among the 52 week low list. I'm curious to hear your evolution as an investor. I, I know you've told it a lot, but I, I just like to hear hear it again. Sure. Well, let me clarify. So that, that new high, new low list statement, what I said was in my earlier life, I used to read the new low list first. Okay. Because you're right. hunting, My for, apologies. hunting for bargains and, and look at that stuff. And then I would read the new high list. And, and part of my thinking there was um, if it was something I already owned and it was making a new high, I probably knew that without even looking at the list because you'd be aware of it just from the smug feeling of self-satisfaction one has from owning a stock that's hitting a new high. Um, but Because it's uh, doing the, it because you bought it. You're, you're very you're uh, smart well, and obviously the market agrees. <laughs> <laughs> not going to take that much credit, but yeah, we, we all know how it really works. So at any rate, uh, along the way, and, and this is, was a, a process over time, it came to be that, you know, something that is making a new high, maybe, maybe something good is going on there in an underlying fashion. And if I didn't own the stock such that I wasn't kind of focused on the new high list, well, that's a pretty good place to look for for companies that are doing well. And and then you can make a decision, look, is this just a trading move? Is this cyclical? Or, wow, is, is this a company that really has proven its its expertise and, and should be, you know, celebrated and, and bought more up? Now, uh, uh, I will use my own example of Markel. The first shares of Markel that I bought, I bought for eight bucks back in 1986 at the time of the IPO. And I have bought stock in Markel as recently as this week, which was publicly disclosed. The filings are out there at 1300 and some. Well, you could argue you're paying a lot more for the same stock than what you did when it was eight bucks. By the way, I rather suspect it won't be eight bucks again. And the value that has been created all the way along, when I think of what I got for the $8 I paid in 1986 versus what I'm getting today, when I'm paying 1300 and change, th those are those are not apples to apples comparisons. And it might very well be that given the, the values that's, that are there and the and the uh, opportunities that are there and the proof point that my goodness, over 36 years, these these people have actually built the value of things such that it used to sell for eight dollars and now it sells for 13, 14 hundred bucks. Uh, they they might they, they just might have some clue about knowing what they're doing. So uh, when you when you see that as demonstrated and, and the just the, the pond is stocked on the new high list with people who at least are showing some signs of progress, I just think it's a good thing to look at. And so I, I, I look at the new high list now first rather than right. the new low list first. But, but, I, but I look at both. Yeah, noted, noted. I, I, when you, well, first of all, I didn't hear it correctly, but second of all, or I don't remember it correctly, but what I heard when you said that is, um, and it's probably a perception issue, but that you've, you've morphed more to a, uh, focusing on quality and, you know, the, the high list can give you those, uh, it, it's not a, I need to go buy it now thing, but it's to put it on the watch list. Um, because there are companies that are likely to your point, uh, may have figured some things out. So that's what I kind of took away from it. I don't know if I took the right and, things, and, but. And I think that's directionally correct. So looking at the new high list again, again uh, probably does point you a little bit, because because for instance, if I saw something on the new high list that I looked at and then I concluded that's cyclical or that's just a trading move, that is probably not something that I would be as interested in as something that I'm, I'm getting that signal that says, hey, these people know what they're doing. And, and they're likely to continue to know what they're doing for a multi-year period. That, that's a very different idea than, than a trading idea. Yeah. Uh, we are full, full taxpayers. So that idea of being able to buy something and hold it for a long period of time and have tax deferred compounding, as opposed to paying taxes every year of what you trade and sell and have a realized gain on, the differential in the total return to Markel over time of being able to buy something and hold on to it versus having to, to sell it and realize that gain and pay taxes every year, it, that's a huge difference. So both constitutionally and by, by behavior and the structure of 
the money that exists at Markel and what we're trying to do with it. Uh, b- building the long-term value by being able to buy things and hold them for a d- long duration. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. How, how, you know, you mentioned the, the capital within Markel. How would, uh, I guess the question would be, would your strategy be different if you were in a fund structure as opposed to at Markel? Uh, you know, just like strictly from an investment philosophy, uh, are there things about being at an insurance company that make you more diversified than you otherwise would be? Or uh, do you get to run your portfolio as you feel is like philosophically pure as you want it to be? Yeah, I am extremely grateful for the opportunity to, to manage the investments within the context of Markel. And I would add, it's not just the insurance company, it's also increasingly Markel Ventures, because again, the cash flow coming out of Markel Ventures is, is the same color green as the cash flow coming out of uh, the insurance business, and they are both substantial amounts these days. So the flow of cash, the capital that gets to subsequently be allocated uh, comes from both those, as well as the recurring dividend and interest income on the portfolio that exists. So, so the good news is, compared to an open-end fund, or, or even a partnership that has 90-day redemptions or whatever, the, the capital here is essentially permanent in however long a sense of the world you, you, can, you can use the word permanent these days. Uh, it does not have a daily liquidity provision to it, it doesn't have a quarterly liquidity provision to it. As long as we continue to operate profitably, there's never, there's never a call on the equity capital company the money. We just we just have to have that to be viable counterparties to the to the contracts we enter into. So the ability to invest with a long term time horizon and and set aside daily liquidity concerns, that's an advantage. And the steadiness and regularity of the cash flows is, is an advantage. So I'm I'm uh, I'm playing a different game than than what others in the, than most people in the in the investment world do, and it it suits my temperament. I'm not good at being quick or fast or outrunning somebody or out out hundred yard dashing somebody. My skill is in thinking about things in longer term time frames and having the endurance. And the and the discipline and just iron will to just keep at it day after day after day after day, uh, and the structure allows for that, encourages it. Uh, the one thing that I've I've heard uh, you speak of that I it resonates with me uh, is the importance of relationships. And I I once, I think I heard you say part of my competitive advantage is that I'm a nice guy. Um, And if not, uh, I'm going to attribute it to you because uh, I think that it leads to a lot of of good things. And I was hearing, I was listening to your podcast with Jonathan Boyer earlier today. And I thought that your insight on who uh, Buffett surrounded himself with is a very interesting insight that I, I think um, I think a lot of people would perceive Buffett to always be the one adding value, but maybe not necessarily getting the value back from being in a room together with uh, high quality people. And it's nice to hear you talk about the importance of relationships in your business. Well, in, in fact, there was a, a new word that I came across this past weekend. I try to be a lifelong learner. And I was reading an article, I think it was in the Sunday New York Times uh, about something. And and what it described were circumstances such that you might have thought you had a relationship with somebody, but what you really had was a situationship. There There were circumstances that caused you to have some exchange with somebody, but it was only because of that particular situation. And as soon as that situation changed, it was not going to mean anything to either party anymore. And and I, I really stopped and paused and, and thought about that concept. Never heard that word before. But I but I think it's a powerful concept and a powerful notion. And and you should you should sort of step back and, and wonder so is this person I'm talking to right now or I'm with or I'm in the room, am, am I in a situation ship with them or am I in a relationship with them? And what do I want it to be? What would be better? 
what, what I mean, you don't need to be in a relationship with everybody. You can't. Human beings are incapable of it. But my goodness, uh, I, I, the, the total tonnage of what other people know is not only an order of magnitude more than what I know, it's orders upon orders upon orders of magnitude. So to, to, to be humble, to be a listener, to sort of be open to what other people say and other people have to say and and to exercise both your mind and theirs by going through some stuff together and 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 moving from situationships to relationships i just find that that's a matter of compound return that's an exponential kind of function that takes place over time and and one of the fantastic things about buffett is he has been doing that for 90 years now I mean, I don't know how verbal he was at two, but I suspect it wasn't too long after that that he was talking and learning and interacting, and and he's he's kept at it for longer than anybody else you can see out there, and that creates a compound advantage, compound learning. Yeah, it uh, for some reason the concept of uh, this person Adam Robinson, uh, he says like he seeks to delight. Uh, people during their day and I think that seeking to delight people is a good way to turn a situation ship into a relationship right uh, I, I mean if, completely. If you... in, yes in, in in Richmond there's a gentleman I know who uh, you know would be in his 70s at this point and he's been a, a, a real leader around this town for a, for a long time and if you ask him sort of his, his daily plan or what he does he says he gets up in the morning and he tries to figure out how he can help other people that's it that is the entirety of his strategy. And he has been doing so for 50 years. So he's a, he's a legend in this town and he deserves to be because he really has operated with that mindset for decades and it, it just it just compounds. I suspect he's one of the happier people uh, around yes. that town. <laughs> I it, agree. It's amazing how, how rewarding it can be to be nice to people and to genuinely try to help people. And, and you know what else I will tell you about this guy? I like his kids too. There you go. And they're—I mean—they're—they're they're good, normal, productive, fun people are, are around Richmond. So that—that's a big tell too. Going to India, uh, giving you a perspective on life, and what have you—what have you learned as you've been doing that a little bit more? Well, it was a fascinating trip. I went with with Saurabh, um, and I think we spent eight or 10 days there. I can't remember. And my number one observation on coming back, which I think is a, is a profound life lesson, is that the uh, composite layers of things that exist in India get you to a point where um, truth is something that contains multiple aspects, and it contains some things within truth that that are probably not true. There's no, there's no simple, undiluted, 100% thing that is is true. And similarly, things that you know you would say are, are not true or false, there are probably elements of truth within those as well. So to to look at things and understand the nuance, the complexity, the multi-layered nature of what life is really like, uh, for, forget black and white. And in fact, one quote that I'll I'll attribute to Sarab. And I, and I think of him every time I, I think of this, and I, and I use it quite frequently, is he says, people have forgotten that there are numbers that exist between zero and 100. And we just live in this world where people seem to, to go immediately to either zero or 100, depending on what you're talking about, and depending on their point of view relative to what underlying facts you, you're looking at. Well, it would be my sense that zero and 100 don't happen very often in life. There's things that tend towards zero and things that tend towards 100, but they never reach those exact poles and they move and they change over time and circumstances. And I think uh, spending that time in India and just having a different way of interpreting that infused my thinking in a, in a way that's helpful. Hmm. What was it? What was it about India that like put that seed in your head? the immensity of it and the, the size and scale and variety of what you would see in any given day uh, was just unlike anything I'd ever I'd ever seen before. Hmm. 
I, I, w- I need to go. I The closest thing I've been is this book called Shantaram. It is the single best reading experience I've ever had in my life. And uh, I, you know, to the extent that that even touches a, a little bit of reality, uh, it it's it's really something. Well, I would encourage you to go and I would uh, suggest, and in fact, funny you should mention Shantaram, um, that book is on my shelf, but I've not read it yet. And one of the ways in which I triage books, because I'm a pretty avid reader and I buy a lot of books myself, but also people know that I'm an avid reader, so they give me books. And I can't remember how Shantaram came into my possession, but it did. And if three people from entirely different realms of my life recommend the same thing, that goes to the top of the list. So congratulations, Bill. You are now number three of (laughs) suggesting Shantaram to me. So I'm going to go back to my office and grab it off the shelf and put that in the queue as the very next book that I'm reading. I got, I have perhaps the most important question of the entire interview. Uh, How do you deserve a good spouse and how do you make yourself a spouse worth uh, loving that from a spouse that uh, is deserving, right? I mean, I think your wife, uh, there, there is not anyone that says anything bad about her. uh, And, you know, I think uh, to the younger guys out there, you know, what would you recommend? Well, it's a spectacular question and it's a spectacular thought exercise. The single best decision I have ever made in my life was uh, pursuing Susan and uh, being successful and asking her to marry me. And by the way, uh, we started dating when we were 15 and we were married by the time I was 19. So I I was early on. Um, Good for you, you didn't give her any choices. You'd locked it down when you knew you had something good. And that's part of the answer of of what you just said. So there's this tremendous temptation to always think of things in terms of opportunity cost and optimization. So you you meet a girl, you you like her, she likes you, but you can't help yourself from thinking, well, what what about another girl? Is, Is there a better one out there? The answer to that factually is probably yes, but to, to, to find someone who you can get along with and gets along with you and the Venn diagram of your values uh, overlaps enough and you make a commitment to one another that you recognize it's, it's not optimal, but this isn't an optimization exercise. It's a satisfaction exercise. And, and you make that commitment and, and you stick with it. And lots of times there's a lot of good days. Lots of times there are challenges and rainy days within it, but in and of itself, the, the challenges are what changes things from it being a situationship to a relationship. And there's just no greater advantage that I've had over the years than, than Susan's steadfast, utter, unrelenting, unconditional love and support, both em- emotional and financial. You know, she was gainfully em- employed, ran one of our businesses for the last 15 years. So she just, she's just steady. Um, and that, that makes my life a lot easier.